Hello everyone and welcome back to my Mars colonization series in Kerbal Space Program 1.6.1. In this episode we're going to try a different ISRU solution and uh, we're going to send this Convertron 125 which was configured by me. I think it's actually been incorporated into Realism overall itself but um, if not I can give you the configuration for it. Uh, which just drills for ore and converts it to either hydrogen or oxygen, consuming about 20 kilowatts of power for this size. The larger one consumes more, obviously. And um, we'll see how quickly it can convert the ore. And yeah, it's about 1.62 tons, the size of it. The mass of it was based on information from uh, Robert Zubrin's book. Uh, he's at least... There, there are a lot of things where I deviate from his plans as far as Mars. But he is an ISRU specialist, so I would go with his numbers on that. So, yep, uh, we are going to try that. We're going to drill for ore, and I calculated its conversion factor based on a certain kind of ore that should be prevalent on Mars. So, a hydrated, uh, I forget what type, of, some sort of hematite, I think it was. Uh, but it was mostly iron, but it just happened to have some water trapped in. Uh, so we're going to try and separate the water out and uh, turn it into hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, we have some fuel cells, but they are among the parts that I have converted. Uh, I have turned, I've uh, taken the stock fuel cells and created space shuttle fuel cells. And that is because the ones that come with realism overhaul, these fuel cell arrays, are based on Apollo. And the Apollo fuel cells are not very good. <laughs> Um, so they're not the best things on the on the planet. I would prefer to use these. And I looked up the numbers. I'm pretty darn sure about the numbers. Um, I used the highest mass cited, and the differences between different sources on the mass of the fuel cells is largely because of ancillary equipment, you know, stuff around it. And so some of them just take the actual cell, and some of them add in the rest of the wires, if you will. Uh, the tubes and so I went with the largest number for that the space shuttle had three of these fuel cells and each of them provided between 7 and 10 kilowatts continuous I think it was upgraded over time I think initially it was 7 and eventually it was 10 uh, they could send 12 kilowatts and they had a peak load of like 14 and uh, again it had three of them so in total uh, about 21 to 30 kilowatts continuous I went with the 10 uh, kilowatt version and the hydrogen and oxygen is being consumed uh, appropriately. I'm not storing the water, so we're going to go with it not storing the water. And uh, yep, yeah, so those are two custom fuel cells. They combine to produce uh, 20 kilowatts and that will be enough to run this converter. But probably not both the converter and the drill, so we do have some batteries. In fact, I'm gonna, uh, thinking about that, I'm going to size that up. Uh, still haven't seen any tweak scale particular issues so far. Um, though I do notice that tweak scaling the solar panels here, you notice this output at PE and AP? I, I don't know what that even means, to be honest. Um, oh, I guess Earth's PE and AP. Okay, maybe that's it. Um, but that doesn't respond to tweak scaling, that number right there. I don't know if the actual power output is going to respond to tweak scaling, but that number definitely does not. So there's that. I still don't understand solar cell degradation. Okay, we've got the radiator panels. I've adjusted the drilling units. Uh, these are the, I've decided to put two on here because we sure weren't drilling very fast. Um, of course, we needed to set it to ore for the recipe. And I've also lightened them up because these drilling units were pretty darn heavy, I felt. Um, it's not this one, that's the standard one. Uh, these are from USI, and I can't find it in this particular list. It's probably in some other USI uh, colonization thing, not logistics, manufacturing. Okay, so I decided to set them to half their mass that they had before. And that means that each of these drills is about 100 kilograms, and then these larger ones are 500 kilograms. Uh, pretty heavy considering, I mean, NASA should be able to create drills that are lighter, hopefully, uh, especially considering the overall mass of this. Basically, by cutting in half, 
two of these drills end up weighing the same as one did before, so we're not changing that too much. Anyway, so we're gonna try and land this on the moon in a location rich with ore, and then convert it to hydrogen and oxygen and see if that works out for us. Okay, so here we are on the launch pad, and I had to tuck in the radiators again because they stuck out because they were on automated mode. And uh, somebody said that uh, this is pivot off and then this is pivot on. Because um, I had turned it off like this on the station. And that, that doesn't seem right to me, but whatever. Uh, maybe... Uh, that was sort of a double take. Seems alright though. Some people asked uh, when I released the parts and I already uh, posted the engines in multiple things. If you look at the videos where I developed certain parts, for instance, the Pac-Man encapsulation device or or the links. You can find videos on these parts on you know among my videos. And usually I link the parts there. I haven't really assembled them into like some sort of unified mod, because they're all over the place in terms of what they are, right? Uh, some of them are one sort of thing, some of them are completely different. Some of them are replicas, like I've got Osiris Rex, I've got a Pegasus rocket. Uh, the Long March 3. Um, so I've got all sorts of things of various kinds that don't really fit a theme. And I, I haven't really decided what to do about that. The only thing I'm not planning to give out are the tanks. Because they sort of have my identity logo, if you will. And, uh, you know, you should be building your own rockets anyway. Uh, these are, this is my rocket, darn it. The, the engines I don't mind giving out, and those are much more complicated. These are just cylinders, for the most part. Um, though actually, the skirt at the bottom is a little bit complicated. That was fancy. Uh, yeah, so if you have a specific request, you can tell me. But I, I've uh, made more parts than I'm featuring here, so it's a little bit complicated if you ask, uh, you know, to have all your parts. So I don't know. I've, I've got... They're, they're lying around in all sorts of places. <laughs> Uh, some, of, some of it is conveniently zipped up other other parts uh, they're probably in Dropbox somewhere I do have a GitHub but I haven't updated it in a while it doesn't even have these engines or anything and of course in addition to my actual parts there's the whole business of modifications I've made to other parts like I created a little uh, Space Shuttle Fuel Cell, and things like that. That's a totally different category. I've created uh, RO configurations for USI parts and stuff like that. Basically, I've got a whole bunch of stuff lying around in all sorts of places. <laughs> I'm not very well organized. Okay, getting to booster set here. Off they go. And actually, uh, this whole engine business should be in the same stage. I keep forgetting to do that ahead of time. I don't know if that's gonna stage right, we'll see. It might double clutch. Oh, I double clutched the fairings. Let me do that then. So this converter is a little bit complicated now, because not only does it have my my conversion things, it also seems to have a Kerbalism configuration on it too, this water electrolysis and Sabatier process. Those are separate. It'd be nice to drill for water. That would be much better. If we could drill for water and convert it to hydrogen and oxygen and just use the water electrolysis thing, but we didn't find any water on the moon, so we just found hydrates and hydrated ore, if you will. So that is what we have to use. Alright, separation and ignition. And 
Well, we don't seem to have, uh, didn't seem to act, well, it did do the specific impulse, but it didn't deploy the extension. I'll have to take a look at that. Okay, and we are in orbit. Very good. And plenty of fuel to get to the moon. As far as lunar ore locations are concerned, there's a good lot of it. But mainly a patch here. That's not the most convenient place. Well, it should have communication with Earth. I don't know what its lighting situation will be once we get there, but we do have the fuel cells. So, okay, this should be a good way to go. Okay, well, communication has delayed the burn a bit, but we should still be all right if we just continue now. We'll just arrive a little later, but that actually saves us some gas. Okay, ignition. Okay, looking good. Yep, all right, let's just plot the orbital capture. And, well, communication when we get there will depend on our other satellites, because periapsis is not particularly good for communication otherwise. Honestly, the plane in which our other satellites are in, well, if they're over here, it should be okay. We'll see. Otherwise, we'll have to do the capture maneuver a little bit earlier where we do have communication. I had to charge up everything. Oh, and again, it says Mars transfer vehicle batteries getting low. I charged it up completely before starting this launch. Well, just as soon as we get here, it says that uh, we have recharged, but I really wish it didn't caused so much trouble in the first place. With 700,000 electric charge, it shouldn't be out of power at all. But I guess we can time warp here while uh, the mission is on its way. I'll just keep an eye on it. Uh, it looks like this location is actually now potentially in communication, so okay. I think we can just do the burn where it is. That's fine. Moonscan 1 doesn't have a relay antenna, so it couldn't help anyway. Alright, we do have a direct line back. It'll only take a short amount of time to do the burn, but we need some time to turn to it and sell the fuel down. Uh, we're sort of at the north edge of that. I would like to... build in some inclination adjustments so we get right in the middle of it. Okay, ignition. Okay. We are going to start our landing stuff. Uh, let's get done with this stage. Well, that's that. Separation. And I haven't actually added the gear to the gear action group. Okay, we're uh, looking good for landing, at least in the right crater. We probably shouldn't be too picky about the specifics. I would like to conserve as much hydrogen and oxygen for the fuel cells as possible, but we're supposed to be drilling for it anyway. Yep, uh, a little bit more sudden than I wanted, but okay. We have landed and drill deploy. Uh, we better get the radiators out. And I guess radiator cooling on, definitely and start ore drill hmm 
Well, the order, well, yeah, it's coming in, but it's not coming in super fast. How's the thermal stuff? Seems all right. Okay, so uh, 740 on the clock. And I'm going to turn on the ISRU locks. Let's go with locks. We're at 384. Let me write that down. Uh, no, no, it's fine. I can remember that. Uh, 740 and 384, and we're going to start ISRU locks. And in the daylight, we shouldn't have too much problem, I guess. Actually, it's surprisingly not consuming as much as I thought. Well, that's because there isn't much ore. Okay, let me go for an hour. Oh, Mars transfer vehicle again. Well, in 40 minutes, we got four units of liquid oxygen. That's not bad. That's better than the other version. Okay, let's uh, leave this be. In fact, maybe we'll time warp at the Mars transfer vehicle and see how it accumulates. Uh, we'll need a different clock, though. Um, so, 508 on this clock, and we're at 388. I should have just left the fuel cells on, too. We obviously need... Oh, I, I've got two drills. I should... Uh, let me repower this first. And then we'll get the other drill out. And I swear. It's annoying me. Okay. Other drill. Okay, now it looks like we're taxing the electric charge. Well, no. It's, it's replenishing. We need bigger drills, clearly. The converter can consume all the ore here, so we need maybe two more drills would be good. Now this isn't the largest stage ever, and the hydrogen takes longer because it's more complicated to extract hydrogen, and you have to take extra power in order to cool it. This might be a little bit too fast though. Okay, uh, let's let's go for a day. All right, uh, that that's a little bit more than a day. Let's check back on our little probe. Okay, it hopped up. Well, as as long as it doesn't break the drills, and we're still well after after a whole day. Did it really do that properly? I swear it seemed to be coming in a little bit early, uh, quicker, but I'd say maybe. A little bit less than 200 units of liquid oxygen came in. So... That's that's not too quick. I mean, considering how light this is. We can see replenishment rate here. In terms of mass. That's another way of measuring things. Oh. Mass is going down. Oh, why has all the... Uh, did this shut off? It's shut off. Oh no, it's still going. Yeah, well, ore is being consumed. Hmm. Well, I guess that's why it's getting light. So ore was being built up, but it wasn't converting while we were away, I guess. Or, well, some of it must have converted. Mars transfer vehicle again. Well, the rate seems fast, but mass, in terms of mass, it's not that. Let me shut this off. It's not that much. Okay, I'm, I'm satisfied with the test. Uh, I'll have to work the numbers a little bit more. This may be, this may be okay. Because our Lander stage for Mars is 16 tons or so. And at this rate, it'll probably take uh, more than a month to refuel it. Uh, the lander that Robert Zubrin proposed and they sort of they have tossed about as far as uh, NASA's Mars missions are concerned, we're talking about about 60 tons. And the expectation is to refuel that in like the full 16 months. You know, they probably send one ahead of time. And, you know, like uh, MADB, send that ahead of time, get it refueled, and then send the crew over. 
so that it's already refueled when they need to arrive. But we are talking about the refueling process taking a few months at least. But I, I think that jives with this rate. Let's set it to the liquid hydrogen now. I guess we could do both at the same time it looks like. I should have done that. Okay, and I'm going to turn on the fuel cells as well. Okay, so the next thing up is to launch another Xenon tank to our Mars transfer vehicle. This time I've included a larger version of the tug. So this is upscaled by about 30%, which yields an additional mass, uh, well, basically double the mass. So it has double the mass and it can also grab onto the tank in the proper place, which will be helpful. And later on, uh, it's this um, tug that's going to be one of the OMS modules for the Mars transfer vehicle. So we'll just position it in the back and it can use its engines to uh, push the Mars transfer vehicle along using methane and oxygen if necessary. Anyway, uh, we've lined up. I'll just manually launch it to make the rendezvous easier. Uh, SAS on, throttle is up, and it is a super heavy. And this time, because of the tug at the top, we're filling up more of the fairing and uh, we are also using more of the capacity of the Sujita Super Heavy. All right, ignition. And launch. So basically, uh, the payload mass of this is about four, uh, 55 tons now, 55 tons. And you saw that we had a beginning delta V of 9,700 meters per second. Okay, throttling down and ignition. Booster separation. Oh! I didn't mean the fairings to go at the same time, but that's all right. <laughs> that, that's that's all right. A little bit low for the fairings to go. Staging. So you can see the assembly here. I forget if I made the engines on this more powerful than the one on the smaller version. We'll have to see. I decided to use one of these uh, NASA docking systems from SSTU instead of my own docking port right there, just to make sure that we can separate off there. Uh, no problem down here because this one has the decoupler, so we'll just use the decoupler there. And I kept the spare hydrazine tanks on here. So we'll have extra hydrazine in case we need it for the EVAs. I don't know if we're going to need more for EVAs. 425 is a lot, but we'll see. Okay, I'm going to keep the thrall down for the upper stage. And separation. And action group 7. Everything looks good. Oh, crossfeed didn't get enabled though. Let me make sure it's not grab. Oh, it is grabbing from the tug. Okay, no, lock that. Get that back up there. Too many docking ports, not enough decouplers. Okay. Let's get a time warp. I want a station tangent orbit somehow. That should do the trick. So we got 500 meters per second left with a 55 ton payload. Well, the closest approach distance of 145 meters could be dangerous, but you know, seems like a good thing overall. Depends on how communications shapes up once we get there, of course. Okay, we've entered the render range of the Mars transfer vehicle, and we're hoping that the fuel gets settled in time. 
Come on, feel. Get settled. Actually, we're we're a safe distance away, thankfully. But come on, feel. Come on. That was close, though. Jeez. I should have started selling the fuel down earlier. Come on. Honestly, this is... Well, obviously it's the heaviest load so far, so it's worse than normal. But previous ignitions that I've done, it hasn't been this bad. It's, it's always worst when it's really critical. <laughs> Great. I should just activate the Tugs RCS. Well, it definitely needs it. Still not settling. Oh, now it is. All right, jeez. Take forever, why don't you? Well, close approach, nine, uh, 300 meters, 9 meters per second. Um, we, that's enough time to get the tug off and dock and have the, the tug take it in. So, decouple node. It successfully removed itself. Control from here. Okay. Got it. And the stage has power, so decouple. Um, well, it's doing its own thing. All right, uh, point retrograde. Uh, this is retrograde. Oh, great. Um, point retrograde, a little bit off from everything else. Yeah, like like that. Seems like the fuel is settled. Ignition. Yep, no more. Okay. All right, that's all done. Control from, well, yeah, we're already approaching pretty close, so control from here. We are very gradually slowing down instead of trying to use the main thrusters on the tug. Okay, we are slowly moving towards our target again and I don't, still don't want to bring it into like a crash course so that'll do it's turning why are you turning let's face the target alright we need to get that tug off otherwise this can't dock well this is a round docking port I'm just gonna put it at the end of the airlock wasn't this the one that didn't have the thruster fire visible before? Looks like that's fixed for now. Looking quite magnificent, gotta say. Now one radiation mitigation method that we can't really use with Kerbalism right now, I don't think, is to put the fuel tanks around the habitat. That's what the Lockheed proposal, their Mars Base Camp version, does but of course if you do that you can't use the fuel tanks as a counterweight for artificial gravity so there are upsides and downsides uh, upside in that case you don't have to carry extra shielding you can just use the fuel tanks themselves and all that liquid to shield against radiation but you can't generate artificial gravity so
most methods have some upsides and downsides like you know with SpaceX's Starship there are upsides and downsides one of the downsides well aside from doing all the aerodynamic stuff one of the downsides is if you have that you know single monolithic thing like you know basically uh, Mars space shuttle if you will um, if you upgrade anything, you're going to have to check it out against all the phases of flight, you know, um, all the re-entry stuff, the trans long transfer to Mars and everything. Whereas uh, with this, since like our Orion-like vehicle, the Lynx, only gets used uh, for a short trip in Earth orbit, right? Because we don't carry it along for Mars. So it doesn't have to be checked out for that whole 1000 day trip and you know if we want to upgrade ion engines we don't need to check those out for how they're gonna do with uh, high stress situations like Mars entry or something like that because they're just gonna do a propulsive capture around Mars anyway or you know they don't have to deal with dust storms for instance so that's a plus side to a modular system Oh, so it's um, mass-wise more efficient because you're going to, you know, this has got to be a fraction of the mass of Starship. So they won't deliver as many people or cargo. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, every system has its plus and pluses and minuses. Well, it's wigging, wiggling around a lot today. I swear, in the last episode I praised Smart ASS for being well controlled in these circumstances, but it's not doing so well right now. Let me just SAS for now. Maybe I'll just line it up and not use the negative parallel thing. I probably need it for rotation though. Well, maybe I can get a rough rotation at least, and then it can refine it. Now, the more payload we want to deliver to Mars orbit, the more of these xenon tanks we ought to have. But technically, I don't think we, strictly speaking, need more than these two. So it depends on what we want the capabilities of the Mars transfer vessel to be. General orientation is correct, but... Okay, looking good. Smart ASS is holding it properly now. And we should have the right orientation. And we're connected. Okay, so we've got, I think it's 36 tons of xenon gas in each of these tanks. And so right now we're talking about mm, a dry mass overall of 118 tons, 119 tons. Let's see. And then of course there's the methane oxygen, which is extra. This isn't showing the, it's counting the xenon as dry mass because of the fact that we don't have anything to burn it with, no ion engines. So actually we're carrying 26 tons of methane and oxygen right now. I don't know how it counts to food, water, and oxygen. But, uh, yep, so we're carrying quite a lot of methane and oxygen. Uh, so counting that out, maybe 75 tons dry mass without any of the fuel. Uh, is that right? No, no, sorry, 85 tons, 85 tons. That is counting the links right now, though. Okay, well, we've done some landing on the moon testing of ISRU and more construction. And we'll bring up the, I, I hope to bring up the ion propulsion module next time. And then there are some adapter, I need adapters to make sure that we get the tugs oriented properly. So that when we try to use their engines, they actually fire the right direction, right? Right now, all our docking ports are sort of haphazard. What we need is an adapter on the top here and bottom here so that when they attach themselves they'll have to attach using the centerline docking port 
and then these engines have to be firing backwards so that can they can be used as uh, retro burn engines and then similarly on the ion side we're going to have to have the bigger ones attached on their center line docking port and firing so that their main engines can fire forwards that's the idea so we'll see I'll have to put that together but for now I think this was pretty good uh, with this I'll say thank you for watching I hope you enjoyed this video if you did enjoy this video please do press like if you have any comments or suggestions please leave them in the comment section below and I'll see you next time